Polestar 1 is a premium GT coupe for the Bentley Continental GT and Aston DB11 set that instead of throaty V8 or V12 power delivers the ultimate in plug-in hybrid technology. It can go further and faster than any PHEV has gone before, plus it's astonishingly fast, very exclusive, exquisitely finished and extremely rare. Did you ever think a Volvo-derived design could be this exotic? There'll never be another car quite like the Polestar 1, and there'll never be another Polestar model like it either, because all future models from the brand will be fully electric, and this is a plug-in hybrid. The world's most sophisticated plug-in hybrid, as it happens. There's handcrafted carbon fibre bodywork and the 609 horsepower four-wheel drive drivetrain has two power sources and three electric motors. You might by now be dimly aware of the Polestar brand due to the growing success of the all-electric Polestar 2. It was to create interest in that Volume 2 model that this Polestar 1 luxury coupe was launched a year before it in early 2019. This luxurious two-door GT was the very first product from this fledgling Sino-Swedish carmaker, which has a history a bit like that of AMG with Mercedes. Polestar began as an independent racer, then evolved into a business specialising in tuning performance Volvo models. It was then bought by Volvo as a badge for the Mark's fastest cars, but now is the company's standalone electric performance brand. You might think it a bit odd for an EV brand to launch itself with a model largely powered by a combustion engine. But two things explain this unusual strategy. First, Polestar wants to show its mastery over electrified vehicle engineering. And sure enough, this car is the ultimate plug-in hybrid. No other PHEV can even distantly approach its 77-mile EV range. The second thing you need to know is that this Polestar 1 began life back in 2013 as a styling study, the Volvo Concept Coupe, which originally was never intended for production. But its designer, Thomas Ingenlath, was determined it should make the showrooms, and when he was promoted to be Polestar's new CEO, he got his chance to make it happen. But only for a very short three-year production run. Brand owners Volvo and Chinese conglomerate Geely approved the creation of just 1,500 cars to be made at a Chinese plant in Chengdu, all of them left-hand drive. These were to be sold in a small selection of global markets, the UK being one of them, where at launch this car cost around £140,000, near on Bentley Continental GT money. Even so, by the time of this test in spring 2022, all models have been built and nearly all sold, with 25 matte gold special edition variants finishing production with a flourish. Even this standard version is super rare, as perhaps you'd want the world's most sophisticated plug-in hybrid to be. This is, in its own way, a landmark car. It'll be a collector's item and a museum curiosity for future generations who might be interested to view the film we're going to bring you now. As usual, with car and driving, the industry's most comprehensive. So, what on earth is in store for us here? This Polestar 1 is the model that launched its futuristic and supposedly all-electric brand. But this car has an engine, and one with a basic design that's over a decade old. A combustion unit that's just one part of an uber-complex four-motor drivetrain that develops more pulling power than your average HGV. Confused? You will be, even if you don't find yourself at odds with the left-hand drive only seating layout. There's an awful lot going on here, which we'll get to presently. You certainly wouldn't guess there was an engine up front, following a twist of the silver Volvo sourced starting knob. Silence reigns as digital instruments spring to life, switches click and warning lights illuminate. A couple of nudges on the crystalline gear selector puts the car into drive. You're ready. But for what? 
Well, it's fast and perhaps even more surprising, unlike most hybrids of almost any kind, the engine doesn't immediately cut in either after just a few yards or at the first hint of any real throttle flex. Your first clue to the fact that this is a plug-in hybrid unlike any other. Actually, it's a car unlike almost any other with an intricate degree of drivetrain complexity. There really is an awful lot going on here. Now, you might be disappointed to pay Aston Martin money and get the four-cylinder, two-litre engine we referenced earlier, but this one is both turbocharged and supercharged. So that there's independent drive for the rear wheels as well as those at the front, this power plant, aided by a pair of active torque vectoring 85 kilowatt electric motors fitted to the rear axle, one for each wheel. More on that later. Yet another motor acting as a starter generator sits between the engine and the car's eight-speed auto gearbox. And powering the three electric motors are two large batteries, one over the rear axle and the other in the transmission tunnel, all of which helps to explain this model's substantial 2,350 kilogram curb weight. You'd want plenty of power to haul all that bulk about. How does 609 horsepower and 1,000 newton metres of torque sound? That's good enough to get you to 62 miles an hour in just 4.2 seconds, en route to a limited maximum, thankfully fixed at 155 miles an hour here. Other Polestar models are stopped at just 112 miles an hour. But this one's different. So different that you're really going to need the huge steel Akebono brakes as used on the McLaren P1. There's a choice of five powertrain settings, the default one being hybrid, which prioritises electric propulsion, unless you really do need all-out acceleration, in which case the car switches into the alternative power mode. The other options are pure, full electric, and all-wheel drive, plus there's an individual screen to allow you to set your preferred drive setup. None of the settings allow you to adjust damping from inside the car. Instead, the Polestar 1 has race-style, manually adjustable dual-flow valve Olin's dampers, formatted with a choice of 22 options to deliver suspension feel to suit your exact preference. You lift the bonnet to tweak them at the front via gold dials on the shock absorber turrets, but you'll need to slide underneath the vehicle on a trolley jack to tweak the rears. Yes, really, on a £140,000 luxury GT. Which is why most owners will stick with the factory settings, position 9 at the front and 10 at the rear. The resulting ride might feel a little firm for some, especially over really poor surfaces. OK, so now you understand a bit about how this car works. Next, you'll want to know how it drives. We already talked about its preference for EV motion from start-off, at which point the car can be set to default to its pure or hybrid settings. Appropriately, given the brand values here, Polestar says the powertrain's tuned to be electric first and combustion second. If you were to set it to and keep it in pure, the company claims it would stay EV powered for way longer than any other PHEV model you could buy, up to 77 miles, or driven less eco-mindedly in near silence at speeds of up to 100 miles an hour. Which is possible because the car's total battery capacity is vastly bigger than you'd expect from a plug-in hybrid, 34 kilowatt hours. That's bigger than the battery size of some full EVs, the Mini Electric for example. When that range finally runs out, or if you switch to power to engage fossil fuel combustion, you expect a seamless transition to the engine, but actually the two-litre unit makes sure you know it's taken over and the character of the car changes. You thought it was quick before, now it simply hurls itself at the horizon, propelled along the bitumen by the impulsive combination of immediate electric torque and twin turbocharged power. All to the rather eclectic accompaniment, not of the usual meaty roar that characterises a GT in this segment, but instead a combination of gravelly induction, electric motor wine, and a rather interesting mix of supercharger and turbo chatter. It's not especially emotive, but it's certainly different. 
pretty much everything about this car is, including the way it tackles the turns. In the modern automotive world, we're used to the concept of torque vectoring, where imperceptible automatic braking allows the inner wheel at speed through a curve to improve traction and sharpen turning. Well, here, thanks to those two powerful motors on the rear axle, the whole setup can work far more proactively. Instead, accelerating the outer wheel as you power through a bend, thereby compensating for the difference in curve radii between the two wheels. Think of it as the system rotating the car in and out of bends, because that's how it feels when you're pressing on behind the wheel. And the result, aided by the drivetrain's commendably low centre of gravity and a near-perfect 48 to 52% front-to-rear weight distribution, is a simply astonishing level of twisty B-road agility. With rapid direction changes you simply wouldn't expect from a car of this size and weight. All of which here in Blighty helps compensate for the fact that Polestar production limitations mean that you're seated on the wrong side of the car. Even the steering is as far away as you could imagine from a rack that presumably is essentially borrowed from Volvo. True, it could be a touch more feelsome, but it's responsive and unerringly accurate. Just as well then that the brakes are also engineered to a level you might not expect, even in this exalted class. OK, so the Akebono discs are cast iron and not ceramic, but their stopping power is immense thanks to six-piston aluminium monoblock gold calipers and 400 by 38 mm discs at the front and 390 mm discs at the back, hence the need for this car's enormous 21-inch wheel rims. The other reason they're so large is so that they can create more regenerative energy to top up the batteries. If you don't like the rather artificial brake pedal feel this creates, then a selectable option in the menu system allows the batteries to be solely brimmed by energy from the engine. As you'd want from a GT, the Pulsar 1's great on the highway too, and not only because of the exemplary refinement. Volvo used to make a conventionally engined GT that cruised around rather like this, the handsome C70 Coupe, which ended production back in 2013. Come upon dawdlers and short notice overtakes are instant thanks to an exemplary level of 50 to 75 mile an hour mid-range punch. That increment's dispatched in just 2.3 seconds. And when you can settle back and pump up the thumping Bowers and Wilkins sound system, there's a bit of semi-autonomous driving tech to ease the mileage strain. A combined adaptive cruise control and pilot assist setup that at highway speeds can take care of braking and throttle control for you and also keep you in lane, providing you keep your hands on the steering wheel. All of which leaves us with a car perfect for its brief era. As a CEO or well-provided for retiree, you'll maybe struggle to justify a big conventional V8-powered GT coupe in this more enlightened era, but understandably, you'll also have major reservations about switching to a full EV in this class, like, say, a top Porsche Taycan or Audi RS e-tron. For us, the Polestar 1 is the perfect alternative, in its own way a convincing EV, but also in its own way a proper performance car. It's rare, it's unique, and we like it very much. You might be less tempted to dismiss this as merely a very expensive Volvo once you view one in the metal or, more accurately, in the CFRP or carbon fibre reinforced polymer because that's what this sleek body shell is fashioned from, a specialist composite that gives the structure its rigidity and lightness. And what a structure. The Volvo Concept Coupe show car this model was based upon may date back to 2013, but the shape hasn't aged much to the satisfaction of Thomas Ingenlath, now Polestar CEO, who created it with current brand design director Max Missoni. We're not sure that it looks its best from this profile perspective, but it grows on you, particularly the lovely line of the glass coupe roof, the Aston Martin-style C-pillar and the sleek frameless door mirrors. 
Then there are these rather dashing rear wings, which apparently reference the classic Volvo P1800 and are tightly sculpted in a way only possible because of the hand-layered CFRP panelwork, unnecessarily referenced by this rather cheap-looking sticker behind the front wheel arch. The wheels, with their striking gold valve caps, are of course huge, 21 inches in size, an inch wider at the back than at the front, and shod with grippy 30 profile bespoke Pirelli tyres that fill the big arches, which on closer inspection you realise aren't that far apart. This car may ride on the SPA platform of bigger Volvos, but a big chunk has been taken out of it in this case, and the Polestar 1 is only 4.5 metres long. Up front, there's undoubted overtaking presence in the gangster's smile that characterises the wide grille, but there's rather too much Volvo here for a car priced against a Bentley, an observation we'll return to again shortly. Now, you might also find some of the design a little fussy, a nod to Chinese preferences perhaps, but the carbon fibre lower valance section, which curves up into the corner cutouts, looks satisfyingly expensive, and the big single-piece clamshell bonnet is a beautiful piece of sculpture that does without the intrusive shut lines that would break its sensual surface. You have to lift it to be able to alter the race-style, manually adjustable, dual-flow valve Olin's dampers tweaked via these gold dials on the two shock absorber turrets. For softer feel, turn to the left. For a firmer ride, twist to the right. No fewer than 22 options are apparently provided to deliver suspension feel to suit your exact preference. Though, because the dials don't have ratcheting feedback or any sort of setting display, it's difficult to know which of the settings you've chosen. You can manually adjust the rear dampers too, but without a garage ramp, you'd have to lie in the dirt under the rear axle to do it. It's time to move to the rear now, where you'll find that this coupe looks every bit of its 2.07 meter width. The impression emphasized by Polestar's signature C-shaped LED tail lights, which sit above a wide angular rear valance with an integrated diffuser and shiny black finishing. A mechanical rear wing is integrated into the boot lid and rises automatically at cruising speeds above 65 miles an hour, though it can also be manually raised and lowered. We talked earlier about the structure and what it's made from. Well, that's crucial here because the CFRP panel works 40% weight saving over a steel body compensates just enough for the extra weight of all that PHEV hardware and its oversized battery, but only just enough tipping the scales at 2,350 kilos. This two door coupe still weighs as much as a full sized Range Rover or perhaps more appropriately, given the market being courted here, as much as either a Porsche Taycan or a Bentley Continental GT. So there you have it. In Polestar's words, the embodiment of an avant-garde GT, complete with pop-out door handles and unlocking, if you wish, activated via the digital key provided on the Polestar One Connect app. That feels far more suited to the futuristic theme here rather than using the rather disappointing Volvo key fob. It's rather a different feel inside though, where in an unfortunate start, you're positioned on the wrong side of the cabin. Right-hand drive production from the Chinese Chengdu factory was never part of the plan for this car. We should perhaps think ourselves lucky we got it at all. Only five other European countries did because this car was basically hand-built and the production line never produced more than a couple of Polestar 1s a day. Anyway, enough with that. If you've ever speculated just how far upmarket a Volvo interior could be pushed, then here's your answer, because predictably, but a touch disappointingly, just about everything here has been borrowed from Polestar's parent Swedish brand, primarily the digital instrument panel and the central portrait format touchscreen.
It's left to special leather finishing, bespoke trimming, mostly faux carbon fibre, and little touches like the translucent gear selector to try and create the required six-figure ambience. You also get gold seat belts, colour coordinated with the brake calipers, the damper controllers and the tyre valve caps. And in a nod to the brand's guiding star vision, its logo is reflected onto the panoramic roof from the overhead console. That carbon fibre trimming features on the doors, which, like the fascia top, are beautifully stitched in soft leather. And the dash has a jewel-like little circular speaker in its centre. The pedals are trimmed in aluminium, satisfyingly crafted silver paddles sit behind the steering wheel, and the centre screen is flanked on each side by a beautifully crafted vertical vent. All very nice, but ultimately not that much different to the cabin of our long-term Volvo XC90 T8 and therefore not really plush enough for a car costing Bentley money. But to some extent, you could say the same perhaps of similarly priced but far more conventional choices in this class, like BMW's M8 Competition Coupe, a Mercedes-AMG SL, or even an Aston Martin DB11 with all its borrowed bits. Unlike those cars, this Polestar justifies your investment in other ways. And once you've come to terms with that, you'll quickly come to terms with this driver-centric cockpit and its cool, understated Scandinavian vibe. Build quality is difficult to fault and the large enveloping leather seats with their unusual tyre tread style upper trimming are better than those you'll find in any of the cars just mentioned. You might struggle to better the sound quality on offer from the 16 speaker 1400 watt Bowers and Wilkins audio system too. This has direct research room transformation technology that allows you to choose three different room modes to recreate the acoustics of a studio, an individual stage and the Gothenburg concert hall inside the car. You access all this through the car's 9-inch portrait format centre screen, which at first glance you might think to be a touch undersized. Correctly, in fact, the far more sophisticated Google Android Automotive OS system screen in the brand's more recent Polestar 2 is 11.15 inches. But once you get used to the smart menus and the crisp graphics, you might well forgive the slightly elderly technology on show here. It works the way that all Volvo infotainment screens do, slow to initially load and displaying in either normal black or bright white formats with a central summary display featuring four customizable panels. From here you swipe either left or right to secondary screens full of fiddly little icons that will be difficult to activate while you're trying to drive. To the left are car functions, safety stuff mainly. To the right are applications, including app connections for things like weather, tune in, Google local search and Spotify. As you'd want with a screen of this sort, the usual Bluetooth, 3D navigation and Apple CarPlay and Android Auto features are all present and correct. So is a voice control system, though it's vastly inferior to the setup you get in a Polestar 2, costing a third of this car's price. Another potential issue for you might be the way that this display has been saddled with taking care of all the climate system controls. Not something we'd normally want, but it actually works quite well in this case because the bottom part of the monitor is permanently set aside for climate functions. Everything else you'll need can be found on the 12.3-inch instrument binnacle display you view through the three-spoke wheel with its squarical Polestar-branded central boss. The drive for simplicity features here too, with just two viewing themes available, based around one basic layout with the control options for both, either Polestar or Minimalistic, buried away in a settings menu on the centre screen. Neither allows you to customise very much of what you see. You certainly can't have full screen mapping, though buttons on the right hand steering wheel spoke do allow you to show trip, media, phone or navigation features on the bottom right of the display. Not that you'll be looking at the instrument screen much if you make full use of the provided head-up display. You might hope for a power-operated sunroof in a car this expensive. Not possible here thanks to the curvy silhouette or at least a retracting interior blind for the panoramic glass panel provided. Polestar says you don't need that because the glass panel's embedded UV ray tinting makes one unnecessary. What else? Well, the seats go a long way back. There's lots of headroom and plenty of width to the cabin too. Build quality seems generally good with the exception of this overhead roof panel which flexes and creaks. And even on a Volvo derived model this expensive, the far most two black buttons on this slim panel below the central screen are blanked off. 
your frontward vision is fine thanks to thin roof pillars and your view towards the back is much less satisfactory thanks to the small rear screen though so good is the rear camera system and parking sensor setup that you won't really notice this as an issue too much. As for storage space, well, the cubby beneath this central armrest is rather shallow. That's because there's a battery pack located just beneath it. But it's sufficient for your phone and provides a 12-volt socket along with USB-A and USB-C ports. The door bins are shallow. An overhead sunglasses compartment has been forgotten. And annoyingly, there are no ticket clips in either of the sun visors. The usual Volvo one in the corner of the windscreen is missing too. Irritatingly, for female owners, the vanity mirrors on the passenger sun visor, not the driver's one, a safety feature perhaps. On the plus side, you get a spacious glove box, two central cup holders below a ratcheting cover, a netted storage area in the passenger footwell and a compartment by the driver's left knee. Time to take a look in the rear. Stepping back across door sills that reprise the sticker message on the front wings. CFRP body optimised carbon fibre layout. So, how to get in? Well, we're used to rear berths in this class being difficult to access, but with this one, it's particularly awkward. Use the one-touch seat shoulder switch to glide the front chair forward, up and out of the way and the revealed aperture is actually quite reasonable for a GT Coupe but to enter through it you've got to negotiate the gold seat belt stretched across the opening. Straightforward perhaps for kids but not for adults. And once inside, well customers in this class don't tend to be too bothered if the rear seats are cramped. These ones Certainly are, as you'd expect from a GT Performance Coupe described by its maker as a 2 plus 2. If there was a six-footer up front, you'd have virtually no legroom at all back here. Headrooms at a severe premium 2, even if you're not particularly tall. Even uncomplaining friends ferried home from the pub might have cause to grumble, particularly if their elbows are being buffeted by a particularly raucous track through these big Bowers & Wilkins speakers. Still, at least there's space for those elbows, thanks to the way that these corner panels have been scalloped out. And even though cramped back here, it doesn't feel too claustrophobic, thanks to the panoramic roof and these large rear quarter windows. The central cubby's provision of a 12-volt socket reveals the age of this design. A USB port would be more useful in this day and age. But you get netted seat back pockets and can secrete valuables away in these little silver-lidded cubbies, one each side of the lovely leather-stitched parcel shelf. Getting out again is even more difficult than getting in, thanks again to that annoying stretch belt. For an adult, at least, it's virtually impossible to exit from the rear of this car with any sort of dignity. And once you're out, there's no one-touch feature to return the seat to its proper position. So you've got to stand there with your finger on the seat button while it eases itself back into place. We'll finish with the boot, but on the way there, we'll reference this charging flap here on the driver's side. Disappointingly, there's no interior illumination for nighttime socket application and no charge level lamp either. Now, most of the time, those rear seats will be pressed into service for luggage duties because the trunk area really isn't very big. Let's take a look. The lid isn't electrically powered, but raises remotely with a swipe of your foot beneath the left side of the bumper if you're approaching laden down with bags, revealing an area theoretically 143 litres in capacity, but which in reality is just 126 in size if you take off the space occupied by this charging lead bag, which is pathetic by class standards. A BMW M8 Competition Coupe offers 420 litres of boot space and even an Aston Martin DB11 Coupe has 270. You could fit in it a couple of airline carry-on bags, but not a lot else. In other words, you're going to need to pack light. Because of the bulky drivetrain, there's no space below the floor for anything other than wheel jack bits. This boot lip has an impractical brushed metal finish lip and the charge lead bag hides a 12 volt socket. Unfortunately, given this area's diminutive size, there's no split folding rear seat feature, so you can't push longer items into the cabin. And here's why. 
Behind this scratch-resistant plexiglass window at the back of the trunk area is this rather unique electrical panel with its bright orange high-voltage wiring via which power is provided to the pair of rear axle motors. Your dad might recognise it as something like an old flux capacitor panel. You certainly might wonder why Polestar thinks it's a styling feature. Mysterious labels decorate the individual power sections. Signal connector, AC and DC charge, MSD, CIDD, battery 3 and ERAD R. An unusual touch in an unusual car. Polestar hasn't been shy in its pricing here. £139,000 is a sum of money that would get you some intensely desirable grand touring super luxury performance coupes from premium brands. Among them, contenders of the calibre of Bentley's Continental GT, a top AMG engineered Mercedes SL or a Porsche 911 Turbo. Maybe also a BMW M8 Competition or an Aston Martin DB11. But this is nothing like any of those cars. It's the world's most advanced and fastest plug-in hybrid. Only 1,500 were ever built, all in left-hand drive, and there'll never, ever be anything else quite like it. We should also brief you on the manner in which you'll need to buy or lease this car, since Polestar doesn't use conventional dealerships. The closest the brand gets to this kind of thing is what it calls Polestar Spaces, basically automotive department stores in shopping centres. At the time of this test, in spring 2022, there were only three of those at Westfield in London, at the Trafford Shopping Centre in Manchester and at the Touchwood Shopping Centre in Solihull. Plus, Polestar has a test drive hub in Milton Keynes and engages in short-term pop-up shopping spaces at malls around the country. The primary idea, though, is that you should place your order online via the British section of the Polestar.com website. Then connect into the brand as and when you need to. They'll come to you when your car needs servicing, three years cover for which is included in the price. That price also gives you an awful lot of standard equipment too. So let's take a look at that now. Now these big 21 inch wheels with their wide 30 profile tires come included. The 10 inch rear rims being an inch wider than those at the front. The LED headlights come with headlamp washers and an active high beam function, plus active bending lights that turn with the steering. There's also an active rear spoiler that rises automatically from its integrated flush position when the car's speed exceeds 65 miles an hour, the spoiler then retracting again below 45 miles an hour. Parking's aided by a 360 degree camera surround view system and of course front and rear sensors. And there are five drive mode settings, pure, hybrid, all-wheel drive and power modes, plus an individual setting, the characteristics of which you can tweak via a menu on the centre screen. Keyless entry is of course included, as is remote trunk lid opening, which can be activated by a wave of your foot under the left side of the rear bumper. These frameless exterior door mirrors are auto dimming and power retractable. As you'd expect, auto headlamps and wipers are included, as is an alarm system. There's also some semi-autonomous driving tech, a combined adaptive cruise control and pilot assist setup that at highway speeds can take care of braking and throttle control for you and also keep you in lane, providing you keep your hands on the steering wheel. Plus, you get a complete portfolio of camera safety features, which we'll get to in a minute. Inside, the Polestar 1's electrically adjustable sports seats are upholstered in hand-stitched Nappa leather and include memory settings and four-way multi-directional lumbar support with seat cushion extensions, both of which are power operated. There's an auto-dimming interior mirror and heat for the upholstery, the steering wheel and the heated Aquablade windscreen washer is also included. There's two-zone electronic climate control with a clean zone active charcoal multi-filter, which on warm days automatically ventilates the cabin when you unlock the car via remote control. Full cabin preconditioning is available remotely via the Polestar One Connect app or from inside the car via the centre touchscreen. 
That portrait oriented touchscreen is nine inches in size and incorporates navigation with 3D mapping plus voice control, Bluetooth and Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring are of course also included. This display is also your access point to a 16 speaker, 1400 watt Bowers and Wilkins premium sound system which uses unique Dirac Research room transformation technology that allows you to choose three different room modes to recreate the acoustics of a studio, an individual stage and the Gothenburg concert hall inside the car. Anything you can't find on the car's central monitor will almost certainly be on the 12.3 inch instrument panel screen which is supported by a full graphical head-up display. Should you need help with any of this or anything you might need in your journey, it's always available with the Polestar Connect service. Assistance is available 24 hours a day via the Polestar One Connect app or the on-call button in the cabin. You can ask for advice or in an emergency situation, press an SOS button for help. The car will automatically make an emergency call after an accident or if it's being stolen. And you can even use the Polestar One Connect app to help track the vehicle if it's ever stolen. What about options? Well, there aren't many. There are five exterior colours with gloss and matte options and your chosen shade will be colour matched to matte finished Polestar emblems at the front and rear of the car. There are also three wheel designs, diamond cut, matte black or glossy black, along with a choice of either chrome or glossy black bright work and charcoal or zinc shades of front seat Nappa leather upholstery. That's it. Otherwise, there are no other options. Everything comes as standard. Let's finish, as usual, with a look at safety standards. You might worry about the crashworthiness of a carbon fibre bodied design of this sort, this being the Volvo car group's very first. After all, with a conventional steel body, bending helps the integrated crumple zones in reducing the amount of crash energy reaching the cabin. Carbon fibre, in contrast, usually dissipates energy by cracking and shattering, but not here. The reason why is that this model's SPA, or Scalable Product Architecture, platform has been reinforced by what the brand calls the Dragonfly, a specialised carbon fibre cross-member that increases rigidity by 60% and adds strength to the chassis. This allows crush energy to be absorbed by the crash structure with any remaining energy mitigated by the carbon fibre body panels into the body of the car. On top of this, as you'd expect, there's a full suite of Volvo developed camera safety features. There's the Gothenburg conglomerate's usual city safety warning, autonomous braking system, and various collision avoidance features too. The collision mitigation support front system is an automatic steering assistance setup and will steer you back to safety should you unintentionally drift across the lane markings in the way of an oncoming vehicle. There's also a collision warning and mitigation support rear system that activates if a vehicle is approaching from behind and the sensor calculates that there's a risk of a collision. In such a situation, the car will dramatically flash all its indicators to try to catch the attention of the driver of the approaching vehicle. But if that doesn't work and an impact is inevitable, the system will tension the safety belts just before the collision. If the car is at a standstill, the system also activates full auto braking. As you'd expect, you also get a lane keeping aid which alerts you with steering wheel vibration. If between 40 and 120 miles an hour, you're unintentionally crossing lane markings without using the indicator. And there's a cross traffic alert with auto brake system which alerts you to traffic when you're reversing out of a space and will, if necessary, automatically brake the car to prevent a collision. A road sign information display pictures speed signs you pass displaying them on the dash and drives a speed sign assist system that can automatically set your speed to the prevailing limit. Distance alert stops you from getting too close to the vehicle in front. Driver alert monitors your reactions for drowsiness and a post impact braking system brakes the car automatically after a crash so that it's less likely to spin off and then hit something else. There's also Bliss, the Volvo developed blind spot information system with steer assist setup that warns you if you're about to dangerously pull out in front of another vehicle 
and will apply steering assistance to ease you back to safety. Of course, you also get all the usual electronic assistance for braking, traction and stability control. Plus, there are the Volvo developed WIPS front seat whiplash protection and SIPS side impact protection systems. And as you'd expect from a car of this price, there's a full complement of airbags, seven in this case, including a driver's knee bag, all of them connected to the car's e-call system, which will see the emergency services advised of your exact location if the bags are activated in an accident. Hill start assist, tyre pressure monitoring, Isofix child seat fastenings and a speed limiter also make the team sheet. It's all very reassuring and hopefully you'll never need the first aid kit. Thanks to the largest lithium-ion battery we've ever come across fitted to a plug-in hybrid, 34 kilowatt hours in size, the official WLTP rated all-electric driving range is vastly greater than any other plug-in hybrid on the market, 77 miles. That puts the Polestar 1 in category 1 of the UK government's hybrid electric car list. The only PHEV we can think of that even approaches this Polestar 1's potential EV mileage capability is the Mercedes S580e long wheelbase limo, which offers 63 miles of all electric driving range and is priced from just under £110,000. Otherwise, most plug-in hybrids still struggle to crest the 40 mile mark on battery power alone. You could only imagine just how far this Polestar 1 might be able to go on a single charge were it not for its prodigious 2.3 tonne curb weight. You'll need to stay in the pure drive setting to get anywhere near the quoted range and not put too much performance strain on the battery. The car defaults to electric drive from start off and as your journey unfolds, will continue to try and use it wherever possible. For longer trips, there's a selectable battery hold mode allowing you to save battery charge for later in your journey when you might need it. As you drive, you can keep an eye on exactly what's being powered by what via an energy monitor you'll find in the center screen's driver performance section. This also gives you average fuel consumption and meters which show your real-time MPG and electrical kilowatt-hour mile consumption. And the bottom section of the instrument screen helpfully breaks down your remaining drive range into battery and fuel-powered mileage. The car functions part of the centre screen has a charge function via which the engine can charge the hybrid battery as you drive, but it does so very inefficiently, so it'll be far better to ignore that and merely plug your Polestar 1 in as often as you're able. The flip side of having that big battery output is longer charging time that would normally be required for a plug-in hybrid, though around five hours from a typical garage wall box should cover most of the daily battery replenishment you'd need. It's less than an hour using a 50 kilowatt public charger. The quoted CO2 return is 15 grams per kilometer and the WLTP rated combined consumption figure is 403.6 MPG. Yes, you heard those figures right. What else? Well, a little disappointingly for a brand looking to change convention, there's the usual three year or 60,000 mile warranty. All will be forgiven though when you start to look at the tax implications of choosing this car over its conventional segment rivals. A Polestar 1 sits in the 3% benefiting kind tax band, which at the time of this test in spring 2022 meant that a higher rate taxpayer would need to find £2,223 per year in company car tax. To give you some perspective on that, a comparable BMW M8 competition would cost you over £18,000 in BIK tax in the first year alone. What about servicing? Well, courtesy of Polestar, it'll be free for the first three years of ownership or for the first 31,250 miles, whichever comes first. When a service is due, you can book an appointment online or via the Polestar One Connect app. A driver will come to you to collect your car, with the vehicle then returned to you within a few hours, though courtesy cars can also be arranged on request. 
As for eco issues, well, in partnership with Volvo, Polestar is implementing global traceability for the cobalt used in its batteries. Traceability of the raw materials used in the production of lithium-ion batteries is one of the main sustainability challenges faced by car makers. The Swedish maker is committed to full traceability and by applying blockchain technology. Its customers can drive electrified Polestars knowing that the cobalt for the batteries has been sourced responsibly. All good to know. We live in this unusual hinterland period between the combustion engine and the electric motor, and there are times when neither seems quite fit for purpose in today's motoring world, even when combined by a typical plug-in hybrid. But the Polestar 1 isn't a typical plug-in hybrid. It's a car that pushes boundaries and an automobile that will fascinate historians when they reflect on the beginnings of motoring's electric age. Yes, for the money, it possibly ought to be faster. It certainly should sound better and it should surely be more luxurious inside. But those priorities belong to a different age. This car sets its own agenda and it'll be loved by individualists of the same mindset. Its development would probably never have been approved by Volvo, but Polestar is apparently its own entity with an R&D development budget funded directly by that Swedish brand's Chinese owner, Geely. As such, it's free to make statements of intent and statements of technology that deliver cars like this one. If you've been converted to the new world electrified mindset, but in another less enviro-conscious life were charmed by big American V8 muscle cars, we could imagine that you'd be very drawn to a Polestar 1. That's because it wraps all that kind of power and bravado into a tech-laden, battery-driven package with no small dose of performance charisma. Even if you're not particularly enamoured by the end result here and don't like the borrowed Volvo bits, the tiny rear seats or the restricted boot, you can't deny that this car delivers a stinging rebuke to anyone championing the notion that electrified cars are all the same. And for that, we like it very much indeed. <laughs>